Now, I'm going out on a limb here, I think, but you guys ever have, like, really bad day? Like, rough days, monotonous days, sometimes monotonous week, rough week, tough week. Sometimes it's tough month, tough year. And just going through that, I uh, the last 66 of them all tough, all right. I, I've, I've done things like this, like, it's time to go to bed. I'm like, I'm not going to bed. Because as soon as I go to bed and fall asleep, I'm waking up to an alarm, and i got to go back to work. And I really don't want to go back to work. So I stay up late knowing that that's going to make me tired. And when I go to work, it's going to make me more grumpy and not thinking as clearly. But it's like, oh, I don't want to do that. I would also do these things, too, where, like, I'm at work, and I start going, what am I going to be at four hours from now? So I start thinking, I'm like, oh, still at work. Okay, six hours from now. Okay, I'll be, I'll be home. I'll be doing eight hours from now. All right, that's probably around supper time. You know, and I just play this game until you get up to like, what am I doing, like 14 hours? And you're like, oh, I'm back at work. Okay, that, that, in that game, shows the end of that game a little bit early. Uh, there's also something that they taught us when we first became teachers, when I first becoming a teacher, they said, okay, this is what you do because you're going to be all stressed out. Bad day, just think of one or two things that you can do. So, like, the first thing is get out of bed, use the bathroom. And then if you could come three things, the more you could do, if you could do it up to five, it's good. But just concentrate on those one or two things because you're, you're just going to be having a bad day. We know it. Just get with it and just start working through it. And I, I thought those things were kind of interesting. It's not anything new, though, because Solomon addressed this very thing, man of wisdom. We're going to be in the Ecclesiastes starting in chapter 2, verse 18, because he addresses the same thing of having a bad day. Having a bad, in this case, a lot longer than just a day. I hated all my toil in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. Now, the vanity means just a blowing in the wind. It's not anything you can grab a hold of. So he's just questioning, why am I even working? Because eventually I'm not going to be here anymore. And all of this stuff goes to somebody else. So I turned about, and think about how he's saying here, you know, having a bad day. So I turned about and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill, so he's not just talking about a job, he's talking about everything that makes up who you are, has toiled with wisdom, knowledge, and skill, must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone else who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow, and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. He understands our point. It's hard. It's tough. And Psalm's like saying, what's the point? Well, you think of, I mean, I just go through it. What is the point? If you're an atheist, what is the point? Eventually you're going to die, as he's talking about here, and your stuff goes to somebody else. What's the point? As a Christian, I still want to say, why do we have to have these hard times? Because our hope is in the life after this one. So what's the point of what we're doing now? Those are good questions. Good thing Solomon gets into it. Continuing on, there is nothing better for a person than he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is, a, is from the hand of God. So he's saying right here, God's making it a blessing for you. For what you do, you need to stop for a moment and enjoy what you have. Instead of striving for more, making it a difficult thing, stop and enjoy where you're at. Because he says, for apart from him who can eat, or who can have enjoyment. So apart from God. So at least we got something. We are supposed to be enjoying the toil. It says it's a blessing to us. For, the, for to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and is striving after the wind. So only to give the one who pleases God. Well, like this whole idea is that the one who pleases God is going to be here again. It's like he's not saying we're going to be gone forever, but the people that are here working hard, he's saying their stuff is going to be left 
for the people that please God. So it's just a sin that seeing there that we, if we're striving to please God, if that's what our goal is, we will be here later. We, we should be enjoying what we have, and we will be here later. Even in our toil, God can give us enjoyment. Now, I'm sitting there going, that's real easy to say. It's kind of a nice thing to believe. Oh, yeah, even our hard times are good. I've had some pretty hard times, and I didn't remember them being good. Solomon, though, he goes on, and he gives us God's plan. So, we're like, okay, we said that we're supposed to be enjoying the time that we're in. You know, it, like, really sucks. We're supposed to enjoy that time. How can we do that? Well, Solomon has a plan. He goes on in chapter 3. He says, for everything there is a season and a time for every matter under heaven. So that, we got to stop with that before we get into this list here, that's just kind of a famous list. Everything is a season. What this is telling us is God is in control. We're thinking, oh, man, this season is a hard one. Okay, so let's start with that. Are you saying, how does this affect us? Let's start with the season. God is in control. That's where we need to start at. How can we enjoy it? We're not to that part yet, but God is in control. So that should give us some ease there. It says there's a time for every matter. So it also says the things that we're going through, God's letting them happen too. Let's read these things. A time to be born and a time to die. This is something that God does. The rest are things that we can do. A time to plant and a time to pluck up what is planted. So a time to go to work, a time to spend the money we get from our work, a time to kill and a time to heal. So they're talking about, you know, capital punishment for things or going to war, but also the time to heal. Now keep in mind, we're not talking one is better than another. We're not saying a time for war, bad, a time to kill, bad, a time to heal, good. The saying is that there is a time for everything. There's a time when these things are supposed to happen. In moving a time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep. Oh. And a time to laugh. A time to mourn. And a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. So kind of look at that going, okay, so what's this one about? You know, gather stones? What are we supposed to be doing? That's just a whole thing of when they were clearing out their vo their orchards and things like that, they would move the stones out of your garden. So a time to uh, cast away stones, get them out of the garden, and then a time to say build a wall, build the temple, build building. You'd use the stones for that. So just to explain that. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. <laughs> i, I got to say, I was debating whether to say my joke or not. They need to put that scripture in Walmart, like put it up on the line. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. Sorry, it was on my mind ever since I read it. A time to seek and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast away. Ooh, my, uh, my storage problems, kind of time to cast away. A time to tear and a time to sow. Now, if you remember the tear, they would, if something really bad happened, they would tear it their clothes. Like in Job, you'd see that before he went and laid down in the trash heap, he tore his clothes. Now keep in mind there's a time for that. And then a time to sew, so you get over it. A time to keep silence and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time to hate? Well, when you think of sin... We're not supposed to like the sin. That's one of the things that keeps getting me with temptation is that we are supposed to hate sin, hate the things that aren't of God. But how much do we entertain that thought and to enjoy it? It's like, no, I'm supposed to not like that. I do, you know, the time to hate is there. There is that. A time for war and a time for peace. Now, I wouldn't say this is a complete list. Not at all. I mean, you go, a time for Facebook shorts. <laughs> and a time for cleaning my desk. <laughs> a time for video games. And a time for family. <laughs> a time for fishing. Yay. And a time for fixing the gutters on my roof. 
Now you think about it, a time for blank, a time. Now, keep in mind, none of those things, they're listed. There was a time for them. Okay? It's not a bad thing that you want to play video games or watch the shorts. However, there's a time for that. Really, we can see when our, if we start sin and abusing a time. Like if I only watch shorts, and I guess I'll throw that one out there. Say I'm only watching shorts, and then I get up and leave my desk a mess. That's something I really need to be repenting of and change my behavior. You know, put off the old and put on the new and think about how I can change that. Or something else that I spend, and now there's some things, a time for, a season for, it might be something that you're doing a lot of. Good and bad things. I mean, I said a time of weeping. I know we've definitely had that time, but you can't stay in that time. I mean, isn't it interesting that when he uses it, he says a time to weep, and then it's followed by the time to laugh. I think that's a very interesting thing. A time to mourn, and then a time to dance. And it's like, that's a really nice way of that being put in there. Now, we can see the sin in abusing the time and the season. We can also see sin in the fallen world that we just end up getting put in a season we don't want to be in because just of circumstances. And, you know, disease, sickness, people doing bad things sometimes puts us in a season. All right, so how does this apply to our toil being difficult? And Solomon goes over that same question as he goes on in verse 9. What gain has the worker from his toil? So what gain do we have from some of these really bad things? I've seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. And he has put eternity into man's heart. So everything beautiful in its time. These seasons are what God's plan is. When we are in them and we are trying to, and we feel like we're drowning, we need to be looking for what does he mean by it being beautiful that we're going through what we're going through. It also says that he puts eternity on our hearts. Yet, so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I mean, we have this eternity on our hearts. We're thinking of beyond now, but we can't understand God. I perceive that there is nothing better for them. Now, he's talking about us because we have the eternity on our hearts. There is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. Wow. So said somebody. I think that was the execution. That was God. <laughs> so, and, that's it. That was my gift. Get, get on it. It goes on. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it nor anything taken from it. God has done it. So that people... Fear before him. That means fear is in awe, in reverence of him, because he is in control of all of this. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. The toil is God's gift to man. Now, to make a jump there, to move to Romans 8, starting verse 18, and we'll be coming back to that uh, to finish off the chapter in Ecclesiastes. But I want to jump to Romans 8, verses 18 through 25, because this isn't, this, this toil that we're going through isn't something new, it is, and it's something that's planned. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time, now their sufferings, they were under persecution, We're talking about people who are having a bad day, they're under risk of being executed, uh, being thrown in prison, all of these things. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility. Now think about that. That's what we've been talking about. We've been subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. 
So he's saying here that the creation is subjected to this toil to be drawn closer to God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth till now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. It's talking about how our attitude should be in the seasons that we're in. Whether they're good or bad, we see them as bad, they're all set up to draw us to draw us to God, draw us to Christ. It's a God's considering our end game. That's what he is to, totally concerned about. And we see that when we jump back to Ecclesiastes, uh, starting in verse 16, this same idea comes out with what Solomon tells us. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. So when you talk about those who are following God and those who aren't, he's saying everybody is going to face judgment at one time or another. There's a season for that. I said in my heart with regard to the children of man that God is testing them, that they may see themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath. And man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. Man has no advantage over the beasts. What are we talking about here? Well, we can see there that he says, everyone dies. He's talking about this from the perspective of, when he says, under the sun, he's meaning, here now, what do we see? When somebody dies, what happens to them? When a Christian dies, what happens to them? What we see is that they are in the ground. We have nothing of, of what happens after that. And that's what he's getting at here. He's saying, what do we see? Under the sun, this is what we see. But we just know that we have the hope. We know there's more to it. And he goes on. All goes to one place. All are from the dust. And to dust, all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward and the spirit of the beast goes down to the earth, saying from what we see. So I saw that there is nothing better. Get this as conclusion here. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? We don't know what's going to be after us. When he's saying rejoice in your work, he's talking about those who are following God. Because if you don't follow God, there's nothing for you. That's what your toil is, toil. Yeah, like somebody says, oh man, this is a horrible world. How could God do this? You know, Well, if you follow God, you have something more. You have a different way you're supposed to be thinking about it. It's supposed to draw us to God. I mean, without God, life is meaningless, and we need to change our behaviors. Like, when we start thinking about our seasons, how do we handle that? And we just need to focus on, uh, focus on our, our view, like our view of our present, of what we're doing right now. We need to be thinking about how do we use our time. When we're sitting there in, a, you know, in that time where we're having a really difficult time, why are we having that time? We need to be thinking about that, praying about that. Let's pray.